Americans. This radio show is for all of you who speak this language. It's about the rest of America. That's a big word, America. It's easy to forget how much it means. It's a big subject. In case I get something wrong or you have any questions to ask, I wish you'd just phone me up here at CBS. I'd be very glad. Hello, who's speaking? Who are you? I'm Orson Welles. Okay, you're Orson Welles. I'm one of your listeners. I took you up on that office. What can I do for you? Don't read us any lectures about loving our country. That's what you can do. I wasn't going to. Well, don't. I love my country without you telling me to, and so does everybody else. Okay? Okay. And another thing. Yes? What do you mean by saying the show you're doing is only for Americans who talk English? Everybody in America talks English. I've got you there. I was just saying it's easy to forget how much America means when you called up. You say we all love our country, and of course that's true, but do we all love America? Do you realize what America means? For us, there's our part of it first. Our neighborhood, streets, and stores. The house we go home to. Neighbors' houses. A church, a school, our precinct. Our state and the other 47. Our new nation, conceived in liberty. Our country, right or wrong. When it's wrong, we'll make it right. What's close to us looks biggest. That's the law of perspective. But there's another law. A natural law that says you see further, the higher you stand. And we're growing up. We stand higher. And from where we stand, we see a hemisphere. Ours from pole to pole. America. Two continents. One continent with a canal. Our half of the globe. Our portion of the earth. The New World. Its first name was the New World. The old adventurers from Europe called it that. The name sounds brighter now than ever. The New World. Tenants are Americans. Hello, Americans. Okay? Okay. We, the people of these United Nations of America, now stand together. We ought to know each other better than we do. It's my job to help with the introduction. You've been traveling down there, haven't you? In Latin America, yes, every country. That's why I'm doing this radio series. The first place I went to was Brazil, so that's where we're starting the show. You mean you're broadcasting from Brazil? Oh, by shortwave? No, dramatic license. Uh, hello? Hello? All right, operator, I'll accept the charges. Ladies and gentlemen, this broadcast comes to you by dramatic license from the first place you think of when you think of Brazil. From the loveliest city in our hemisphere. A gorgeous capital with a name that sounds like a music cue, which in this case it is. This broadcast comes to you from Rio de Janeiro. The Carioca. I've always liked that tune. Cariocas are what you call inhabitants of Rio. It's a word like Angelino or Maverick or Hoosier. There are a special sort of people, karaoke. They get an extra lot of fun out of life, which is understandable when you consider where they live. And they're the best-natured folks I've ever met. I hope they'll forgive me, then, for playing a Roomba on this program. Roombas don't come from South America. They originated in Central America. The one you hear now was written some years ago in North America. Anyway, for Yankee ears, this song really does stand for some part of the excitement of this place the glamorous, expensive, international side of it. The golden beaches on the Copacabana, the casinos, the smart women and the pretty girls, the side of Rio, the karaoke is the naturally proudest stuff. But there's another side of Rio. You hear it? Not a seamy side, not at all. Even if smart isn't the word for it. No, indeed, if Rio's backyard isn't exactly gala, it's even gayer than Rio's front lawn. There isn't a jazz smith up north who could ever express it. It's set to music, but the music's all its own. Rich, deep, Brazilian. Comes rolling down to Rio from the hills. Frost in the street. Everybody dances to it. Called samba. It's 
scramble the two words music and Brazil together and then unscramble them again, you end up with the word samba. Also, if you scramble a moderate number of Brazilians together and then unscramble them, you find out they've been dancing the samba. I think they'll admit they need very little provocation to begin with. And once they've started dancing, they need no encouragement at all to continue. No one is standing by to give them the rhythm. They roll their own. Using matchboxes, straw hats, tabletops, little pieces of wood, anything at hand. If no one is standing by to stop them, they're quite capable of dancing until dawn, and then another dawn, and then still another. From all this, we neighbors have guessed that the samba is quite some phenomenon. Dig that rhythm, you cat. That's the Amazon and the conga talking. <laughs> Right here, right here, I'd like to remark that samba, like some wine, doesn't seem to travel very well. Anyway, I've heard sambas up in the state, seen groups of my fellow citizens dancing what they hoped was samba. <laughs> and from where I stand, which is right in the heart of the samba country, I can tell them now they don't know the half of it. <laughs> Samba's the old two-step, really, with a South American accent, or do I mean the one-step? Not being a dancer, I guess I'd better drop out of the conversation. We'll just play this one instead. Uh, you listeners up in North America, try it. Roll up the parlor rug, grab your best girl, and see what you make of it. Para!
de mato tem, gosto de coque tem, samba na gente embalangando. Tem a pele morena e o corpo que brilha dentro do peito do Brasil. Tem a pele no meu corpo, que brilho dentro do peito do Brasil. Cantei em São Paulo, cantei no Pará, tomei chimarrão e comi batata. Eu sou brasileira, meu pai me revela. Que a minha bandeira é verde e amarela. Cantei em São Paulo, cantei no Pará, tomei chimarrão e comi batata. Eu sou brasileira, meu pai me revela. Que a minha bandeira é verde e amarela. Tem cheiro de mato, tem gosto de coque, tem samba na gente, tem balangando. Eu digo que tenho, que tenho um ambas, que tenho no corpo um cheiro de samba Só falta pra mim um molino fagueiro, seja do samba e bom brasileiro E eu digo que tenho, que tenho um ambas, que tenho no corpo um cheiro de samba Só falta pra mim um molino fagueiro, que seja do samba e bom brasileiro Tem cheiro de mato, tem gosto de coque, tem samba na vida, tem balangando Tem a pele no meu corpo, que brilha dentro do peito amor do Brasil is doing the singing. North America, South American favorite, Carmen Miranda, no other. <laughs> Carmen, for? Carmen, for the, uh, for the benefit of our listeners up north who may be trying to dance to this, yes. may I tell them to relax a little bit and just sort of bounce in the knees? Ah, oh, please do, Arthur, and tell them to relax enjoy themselves. Yeah. Enjoy yourself. <laughs> You know, Arthur? Yes, I know. Why don't you sing just a little bit of samba with me? Yeah. Oh, no! No, I can't sing. No. Oh, oh, no. Look, look. <laughs> you just come from Rio. No, no, and no I, I can't. I teach you, I teach you, I teach you, I teach you. All right. Ah. Uh -huh. uh -huh. uh -huh. uh -huh. No tabaleiro da Baiana tem. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, again. Outra vez. Outra vez. No tabaleiro da Baiana tem. Bata pa ho karo, bata ho tenumbo, ayo yo. Quer pedir você me dá o seu coração, meu amor, de ayá, me dá, me dá, me dá. E no coração da baiana tem o quê? Sedução, oi, cantarei, ilusão, oi, cantumplei, pra você. You know, ladies and gentlemen, there's a lot more to samba. As I've just found out, there's a lot more to samba than meets the virgin ear. There's good reason why our bands can't seem to play it right up north. Samba has its own instruments, for one thing. Now, I've got a full complement of really top samba players here at the microphone, and they're going to help us now to investigate the anatomy of samba. We're going to see, if you'll excuse me, what makes samba run. Uh, now, I'm no authority, but plenty of authorities are standing by. What you hear now, for instance, sounds like a drum, doesn't it? Well, it looks like a drum. Must have some special name, though, probably uh, unpronounceable. Durdu. Durdu. Yes. Well, that's not so hard, Simon. Uh, looks African. It is. Uh, Durdu, I might explain, is a rather long, rather narrow drum that tapers down at either end. This is the first tambourine. Tambourine? Yes, correct. Well, uh... Ladies and gentlemen, the uh, tambourine is not a uh, tambourine. As you can hear, it has no little jangling metal disc. It's square, for one thing, rather small, very crude looking. It's uh, just a rough frame with some kind of tie. Cat skin. Cat skin. <laughs> There's some skin jack. Stretch over one side, yes, cat skin. The uh, player beats it with a small stick. The name of the stick doesn't matter, it's just a stick. This is the second tambourine. Ladies and gentlemen, tambourine number two. 
And this is important. The second plays a different rhythm from the first. Oh, I was noticing that kind of people. It's very complicated, too. It is too complicated? Well, we'll, we'll get used to it. Well, the next is the pandero. 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 Yes, yeah, something wrong, Senor Well. Well, no, I... Pandero, I'm just confused for a minute. It's all right now. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this instrument, oddly enough, is exactly like our tambourine. Well, that's the way things are. Um, uh, yes, you're quite right. I... I ought to say that the tambourine... I mean the pandero is played with the bare hands. One shaking it, the other beating the rhythm. Now we shall go on, yes. This is the record record. Reco Reco. Yes? Why, it's why, why is it called the Reco Reco? Well, because it's the sound it makes it. Because it's the sound it makes. That's a yeah. very good reason. The Reco Reco is a long block of hard wood with notches in it, and the sound is made by scratching another piece of wood over the notches. You want to say more about the Reco Reco? No. Why, that about covers it. All right. Now you hear the ganza. Ganza. The, the uh, ganza is a longish metal cylinder filled with pebbles or beads or teeth or something. The gentleman here handles it with all the flair of a bartender shaking a cocktail shaker. Now we hear the cuica. What's that, Simon? Cuica. The cuica. Cuica. Well, this weird sound comes from a drum. However, as you notice, it isn't beaten like a drum. One end is open, and attached to the inside of the hide is a rod. When you yank it back and forth, uh, that's what you hear. There you have it. Rhythm of the samba. To us neighbors, it doesn't sound easy, and it doesn't look easy. But Brazilian babies can beat out samba rhythm before they can talk. And they can uh, dance to the samba rhythm before they can walk. At least that's what I was told, and I believe it. popular saying, and like many popular sayings, it can be misconstrued. It might lead us to believe, for instance, that uh, Brazilians think seriously of nothing but dancing and singing. This isn't true, as any Brazilian will tell you. That's right, Arthur. It is true. Brazil is a big country, a very big country. Indeed it is, and a wonderful one. I like it very much, and every Brazilian likes it very much. I've noticed that, Carmen. Some like the Setois of the North, some like the cattle plains of the south. Some like the port cities along the coast. Some like the jungles in the interior. But all Brazilians like Brazil, as you say, Carmen, very much. 
There's a lot to like. There's a lot to tell. There's history and legend and romance. Most people don't care very much for statistics. Depends on what interests you. For instance, if you're a businessman... That's what I am, a businessman. I will tell you something about Brazil. This country is three million square miles of the biggest wealth potential on God's green earth. And I really mean green. What you know, they grow two-thirds of the world supply of coffee here in an area of one-fourth the size of Ohio. And that's only one item, coffee. Well, I guess if you're an economist, you'd be interested in all the other items, too. Right. I'm an economist. And everything considered, it seems simplest to say that Brazil could feed the world. Everything grows here. Wheat, corn, tea, rice, yes, sugar, certainly, fruit, uh, tobacco, cocoa, cattle. You could probably go on for quite a while. Oh, yes, I could. But those are only foods. Then there's cotton, rubber, hardwood, dice, wax. We'll have to arrange a special broadcast. Until then, let's just say that it's a very fertile country, Brazil. More than fertile. Pardon? I'm a mining engineer. I've just been through the state of Minas Gerais. That's the gold country. They've been getting gold out of there for two and a half centuries. And when they don't get gold, they get diamonds. Big ones, too. Great big ones. But I'm not so much interested in that. Well, something more interesting than gold or diamonds? Not as romantic, maybe, but I'm more interested in the manganese. You need it to make steel. They've got enough here, untouched, to make new ball bearings for the entire solar system. And they've got the iron to use it on up in the valley of Rio das Velhas. Biggest iron ore deposit on Earth. Good thing to have, especially these days. Well, Brazil's got it. Fabulous country. Well, they say that God is a Brazilian. Oh, excuse me. Would you repeat that and then explain yourself? Oh, certainly. I'm a sociologist, and I was just quoting a Brazilian saying, God is a Brazilian. And that is why he covered this country with so much. Matter of fact, it's estimated that Brazil could contain 900 million people with plenty of living room and food and comfort. Well, that's half the world. Only about 45 million here now. But where would all the extra ones fit? You can't send them into the jungle. No, sir, you're absolutely right. You can't send them into this jungle. There's nothing like it. I'm an explorer. Been at it 40 years. Seen everything in Africa and Indian Malay, every place. And take it from me, there's nothing like the Brazilian jungle. So thick you can't get in, and when you get in, you can't get out. So how can you live there? Well, people live there now. Indians. Exactly, people. The odd thing is that there is not a square mile of Brazil that can't be lived in. And this is true, even though huge areas are impassable now, and others are unexplored. Which means simply that Brazil today is the last great frontier. Someday, though, the jungle, like the other frontiers, will be pushed back. Do you agree, Mr. Explorer? It'll take a dang big push. It's going to happen, there's no doubt of it. That's why I'm glad we naturalists have been busy collecting specimens and making notes before it gets too late. I suppose it goes without saying that Brazil is a naturalist paradise. Charles Darwin put it this way. Brazilian scenery, he said, is nothing more or less than a view of the Arabian Nights with the advantage of reality. Oh, I'll have to remember that about the Arabian Nights. It's very accurate. You can take an hour's walk around the city of Belém, for instance, and get about 500 different kinds of butterflies. Then there are the flowers, the insects, the animals, all in unbelievable profusion. Monkeys, vampire bats, hummingbirds, jaguars, stingrays, crocodiles, giant snakes, parrots. Oh, that's what I like, the parrots. We just got married, my husband and I, I mean, and we were in Rio on our honeymoon, and there's a restaurant we went to where you sit on the terrace, and right there you can reach out and touch the jungle, and the parrots come out and look at you. My wife wants to take at least two dozen parrots back home with us. Me, I'm an architect, and I prefer some of the Baroque colonial buildings I've seen. You don't find a better example of that sort of thing in Minas or Bahia. That's quite a problem, moving large buildings from one country to another. I think it's been done, though. Castles or something like that, and crates. Oh, he's just joking, but I'm serious about the parrots. Maybe there won't be any more when there's no jungle. Hey, you ought to see that jungle. I'm going to. Uh, too bad it's going to be done away with. We'll have to chart it first. Most of it's never been seen. That's going to take some little while. It will be done. Now, what's going to happen to you gun and camera boys when there's nothing left to explore? And without a good jungle in the world, what are the adventure story writers going to do? We'll pass over that question for the moment. Your credentials, please. I'm a writer. Came down here to Rio to do a family novel about my hometown, Elko, Nevada. Distance lends perspective. What I like here are the air-conditioned skyscrapers. Well, there's certainly nothing new to you. Contrast. That's new. You go up to the top floor of one of these slick buildings and look out towards the hills and see real jungle. Dances and music right from Africa. Skyscrapers and jungle. I like that. And I like the idea of a drop of blood here in Rio. What about a drop of blood? Well, 
First, there are the Portuguese. Spanish, Arabic, Nordic, Greek, Moorish. Portugal's the melting pot of Europe. All right. The Portuguese come to Brazil. And then others come from Europe and Africa and North America. So that today, a drop of real Brazilian blood is an honest-to-goodness drop of all mankind's blood. That's true. And it occurs to me that since men in the world have to live with one another and get along somehow, they might learn a great deal about tolerance and quiet decency from the Brazilians who have the blood of all men. Remember the story about the committee of blind men who investigated the elephant? They handed in quite a report. One of them said the elephant was shaped like a tree trunk. One of them said he was a snake. One of them said he was a sword. One of them insisted he was made out of a length of manila rope. One of them thought he was a wall or a sort of dry whale. I forget just how it goes. Each expert had a different point of view. That's what I'm trying to say. A different version of the truth, depending on which section of the elephant's anatomy he happened to grab. Now, I don't pretend to be able to see any better or any more than anybody else who might try to describe these countries. But I promise I won't concentrate solely on the trunk or the tail or the tuft or natural resources or... Indian war dances or butterflies or big business. It's not easy, but I'm going to try to outline enough so you can fill in enough to get some notion of what the other half of America really looks like. Your wealth, but we must go now. The plane is waiting. Oh, that's right. Uh, thanks. And excuse me, everybody. I've got to get out of the airport. This week we're flying the Andes. Tomorrow, by special dramatic license, we'll be in Cochabamba. From there on to La Paz and Lake Titicaca on the Altiplano. Then the Northwest, Cusco and Quito and Bogota. Next week we'll tell you about it. The Andes deserve more than one broadcast, but I'm afraid we're in a hurry and we've got a lot to tell. For now, I'd like to thank the fine Brazilian musicians who brought us their authentic music on tonight's broadcast. I'd like to thank Lud Gluskin, who was also around and did the conducting. And as for Carmen Miranda, well, Carmen, see, sir. Here's a big abrazo. Thank you very much, Austin. Hasta luego. Hasta luego, Carmen. Hasta luego. Hasta luego, todo mundo. Good night, Americans. This program is a presentation of the Columbia Broadcasting System.